James Pina. He just came home from the service and he wanted to make a little extra money. So this Sunday, him and I were going down because they needed some help on the lumber ship. We didn't have no car. As we get out to Totten Avenue, this gentleman come by from Seekonk, the longshoreman too, he picked us up and he brought us down. So he was working in the hole in the lumber ship. You know, them beams, they didn't take them all out. They left one in, which by right, they should have been all taken out because it makes it safer. So uh, he was working down the hole and this, this gentleman that picked us up, he was running the winch. And as he picked up the load, the beam went up, went down, and caught my brother-in-law in the back of the head and killed him outright. That was one of the saddest days. Well, and I had, and I had to come home, home and, tell and I had to come home and tell my wife about it. That was really tragic. I'll never forget that day. Well, the end it was hard. And the conditions was hard. It was no automation then. It was all back work. Very hard work then. And a lot of things they had to do by hand, like even tying the lumber and stuff there. They had to pull that in there and drag that and tie that. <clears throat> it wasn't that easy as they have today down there. When we were working with lumber boats, everything was pre-slung. In my father's time, they used to make those loads, put those loads together all day long. And, and I don't think I could even do that. The only experience I have with that type of work is when we had cargo that fell apart or a load broke. We'd send it out on the dock and we would have a team of guys, uh, we would call them woodpeckers or, you know, because they were working with the, the broken bundles, but they would put those bundles together, make them, remake them, and reband them. And that was the only type of experience I ever had with making those loads. And I can tell you, just the day of that, you know, you, you, right on the job, mm -hmm. you'd be thinking, I'd never want to do this every day. You know, it was, it, was, it, was, it was back breaking work. Before you was allowed aboard the ship, they used to put a monitor, like a little, little look, almost looked like a little <coughs> camera, and they put it on everybody's lapel. And that way there, if you didn't see it on yours, I would see it on his. And if it started to turn colors, I forget what the colors was today, that means everybody was supposed to come off the ship because there's too much radiation in the hatch we were working. Uh, uh, when they do the scrap ships, you know, you, you've got scrap dust all over the place, and it settles into the ground, and then you've got a coal ship coming in, they're unloading coal, the trucks are riding up and down the dock, this dust is going up in the air, so you're not only breeding the coal, you're breeding the scrap dust, coal dust, lumen oxide. So, uh, you know, we, try, we talk about it, and we're concerned about it, and we try to tell our union brothers to wear masks. Uh, uh, if at all possible. Uh, when we start a ship, we usually have boxes of masks for them, but a lot of guys like not to use them. But yeah, that is a concern of ours. When, you, when you're unloading steel, there was the pile, steel piling. And uh, say it was 40 foot or 60 foot long, and you got a 40 foot opening to the top. And they had to coordinate this <laughs> thing, turn it to get up. And, and if it wasn't done right, it would hit the side of the ship, snap the, ch the chain mm -hmm. at the time, and the steel come down. I saw one guy get, get uh, killed in that way. Another time, a load of pipe, five, six tons, you know, hit me, threw me in, the, in between the uh, other pipes, and looking up, six or seven tons over me. I don't know how I got out of it. And that was it for me. I left the one. <laughs> They're not going to carry me out in the stretcher. I got hit on the waterfront. That, uh, the last time I got hurt, I said, I was a walking foreman. I went down the hole to check the cars out because the lashing. So I got behind one, behind one car there and to pull the lashes out. And I bent down to pull the lashes out. This guy, he didn't know, he sort of, and I just happened to bring my head up. He threw it in, he thought it was putting first, he threw it in reverse, and hit me both legs. They didn't think I was gonna walk again, but I uh, get a guy like DJ, young DJ, so tell me, ah, you know, come on, I got back, you know. And another time I got hit in the head, the guy let the big, Cargo hit me in the head, and I was out of work for a while for that. But uh, I developed the scratches here and there, you know. That night started for me with a phone call, uh, probably about the time the news came on from my daughter, and she said, where's Marshall? And I said, why? She said, there's been an accident down the port. 
the operator was operating on a scrap iron job, and the iron that he had in his bucket was a little too heavy for what he needed to do with it. It was too much weight on the crane, which snapped the boom, which it's, I guess it whipped back, whipped, yeah. and the gentleman was impaled. It took the man two and a half hours to die in that seat. Uh, they were well, immediately, the first thing we hollered out is, you know, call 911. Uh, there wasn't much they could do for him. A pin had went through him. Uh, he didn't die right away. And the last thing I heard him say over the radio was, Stevie, get me out of this goddamn crane before I die. He said that was his worst nightmare. And the next day, <clears throat> you have to excuse me for a minute. It, it was the ugliest thing I've ever seen. The next day, I asked my wife to, uh, Give me a ride back down there. And what I saw was the crane laying over the hatch of the ship. And I could hear the man's voice in my head. Yeah, you don't forget I kind of dropped to my knees. I prayed. My wife came and got me. And I left. And uh, so when I'm running a crane or any piece of machinery or around any machinery, I think of things like that. I think of what can happen in a split second, in the spur of the moment, uh, just turning your head the wrong way at the wrong time. When he came home, he was torn up, it's, it hits and the first thing he will say is, that could have been one of, one of us. And he did mention, that could have been my cousin Marshall. Marshall was supposed to be on that crane. Then the anger sets in, because Stevie and Marshall, they have fired many people on the <laughs> job, like you said, mm -hmm. because they'll tell a person one thing, and if that guy doesn't whip into shape, as you can see, mm -hmm. it can be life-threatening, and do the right thing instead of sassing back, and they'll fire him. And Stevie always says, if a man's overtired or doesn't mm -hmm. know what he's doing, especially dealing with a crane mm -hmm. or, and dealing with that weight, which sometimes they have bulldozers mm -hmm. hanging over the other gentlemen's heads, one mistake, and it's over. So Stevie will tell you, not on my watch. I will not go to someone's house and explain to their wife or their mother mm -hmm. why my man died on my watch. It leaves a silence in my house anyway. He, he, Marshall doesn't talk about those things. He, it's internal with him. But it leaves a silence for a while. Matthew asked him last week, when can I go to, to work with you and drive the cars off the boat? How old do I have to be? Now, the child's nine. And Stevie's like, well, I think you got to be 16 at least, and you have to have a driver's license. And I'm just looking at Stevie, and I'm like, mm, I'm not sure I want another generation. It's a hard life. If he chooses after college, and he has a career to do it on a part-time basis, mm -hmm. more power to him. But it's a hard life. It's a good life. You have to really love your job. Like you said, a lot of the young people down there now, they don't love their job. They're doing it for They're a paycheck. They're just doing it for a paycheck. And to be part of the ILA 1329, you have to love your life. 